Good evening, Calvary Chapel, Concord. Hey. Hey. Good to see you guys tonight. And it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 For he's good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Let me get a cough drop and we'll get my ear done. We'll pray. It's a great way to start. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we are just in awe, Lord, of, of who you are, what, Lord, you're capable of, and what you're able to do, Lord. And Father, we're so in need of you to govern us, to, Lord, teach us you know, just how to surrender, how to yield to you, and how to walk in harmony with you, not not being stubborn, Lord, or our Father fighting against the, the line. But Lord, just yielded to you and allowing you to work in us the work that you want and that you see as being needful. Lord, you know us, and you know, from the beginning to the end, Lord. And you know, Lord, what our, um, <laughs> what our position is before you, Lord, just dust. But Lord, you take us and you breathe life into us. And Lord, you use us and you make us a part of your plan, Lord. And Lord, there's just no way that any of it we could do in and of ourselves and by ourselves. So, Lord, we come just to depend and rely upon you and trust in you, Lord, explicitly. But, Lord, we need your instruction and we need your strength and your power and the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be able to do that. And so, Lord, we just pray for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. That, Lord, you would just strengthen us and, Lord, make us capable in every way, not because of us, but because of you. Lord, I also just want to lift up Calvary Chapel at Chino Hills, Lord. And Pastor Jack, Father, we just lift them before you as they really are pushing uh, the limit, not the limit as far as believers go, but just as far as the, the state officials and those in the social media uh, realm or uh, world, Lord, so to speak. And Lord, they, they just are waiting for one little thing to, to shut them down, Lord. But we pray that, Lord, you would be powerful and mighty and that, Lord, you would just you know, ruin the plans of those that would march to Satan's drum. And Lord, that you would save many a child's life through this and many a mother, that Lord, you would just reach out and touch and reconcile them to yourself, Lord. Father, there's just a real battle going on right now. And uh, we pray that, Lord, you would put us where you want us. And, Lord, just use us in the way that you see fit. Lord, I also pray that you would just take tonight, and, Lord, let it just be sweet, a sweet savor unto you. And, and Lord, that the worship and the, the, the teaching of your word would be as from your heart to us. And Lord, we just want to give you all the glory and all the power. And uh, just to bless your holy name. Father, bless the worship and the praise and Lord, just the, the things for the kids. And Lord, just each and every one of these things, we lift it all into your hands. We pray, Lord, for your mighty touch. We pray it in the name of Jesus. 
And everyone said, Amen. <clears throat> We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung upon that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God, this rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, we shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. We shout out your You 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great.
Jesus, Redeemer, mighty to say, you are the love song we'll sing forever, bowing before you, blessing your name. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord,
give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way. surrender all 
come before you and surrender for trusting you, Lord. You are so good to us, God. Thank you, Jesus, that, Lord, no matter what is happening in this world, and it's getting crazy, God, we can know that you reign in righteousness, in truth, in power. Lord God, we can know that, that you are good, that you will give us all that we need for life and godliness, that all of your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, that we stand on holy ground every day because you live in our hearts. God, we praise you and thank you so much that eternity lives in our hearts because you're there. Thank you, Jesus, that you've invited us to come into this precious place of fellowship with you and with boldness. And thank you that you've invited us to lay all of our supplications and our requests before you. And God, that you accept them because of Jesus. <laughs> Lord, we stand before you because of his righteousness in us. And we praise you for that. Come, Lord Jesus, we ask. Anoint your word. Anoint our hearts to hear it. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Love one another, guys. You ready? Okay. Okay, hello everybody. Good evening. Happy Wednesday. It's an, yeah, good evening. It's another Wednesday. Good to see the, the church family here. Ah. <laughs> yeah, 
Brian and Missy are trying to go with me on my family vacation, but we're church family. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not paying for you guys. <laughs> I'm paying for my kids. You're not my kids. <laughs> anyway, tonight, uh, Pastor's going to be teaching us on Exodus chapter 29, and it's verses 1 to, keeps going and going and going, 46. Yeah. What's amazing? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start reading a little bit, and, and I'll read a few verses here. Okay, anyway, Exodus chapter 29. Aaron and his sons consecrated. And this is what you shall do to them to hollow them for ministering to me as priest. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. <laughs> well, I didn't know the words were behind me again. Okay. You shall, you shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. In the basket? And Aaron and his sons with you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take their, the garments, put the tunic of, on Aaron, and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod, and the breastplate, and gird him with the intrinsically woven band of ephod. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for, for all that you do for us. Thank you for your sense of humor. You can tell by the way we are. And we do praise you. We do love you. And thank you for all that you do for us. Please anoint our pastor tonight as he brings us your word and teaches us. And we do praise you and give you all the glory for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Amen. Good to see you guys all tonight. Blessed every time we get together and we're able to fellowship. Uh, just a couple of things that you guys need to keep in mind. Uh, the 31st, right, Britt? Is, 30th is a Sunday, right? So October 30th, we're still getting together. There's some flyers I think that Britt made up to give you a little bit more information. But we're just encouraging you guys to come down. And if you have kids, bring your kids. If your kids have friends, then ask them to bring their friends and invite them because we'll have the jump house inside here and uh, uh, we'll have some uh, games and stuff like that for them to play and uh, some candy giveaways and stuff like that so we can minister to them. And at the same time, we're doing a chili cook-off too. So if you've got a good chili, uh, bring it on down and uh, we'll leave a little bit for testing and then uh, the rest will be consumable. So you have to watch the judges carefully. <laughs> if, they, if they drop, then you need to stay away from that chili. Or if they run out of the, the room with smoke coming out their ears, <laughs> you know, could also be a substantial problem. Um, so that's going on then. Also remember the date for the Christmas dinner, December 18th. That's what I thought. And is there anything else? Samaritan's first is beginning uh, second week of uh, of November. So kind of some things that we could really uh, use your help and uh, all great opportunities to minister for the Lord. So, amen. amen. Moses has been up at Mount Sinai for almost 40 days now with God. He's been receiving instructions on how to build this portable worship center that we call the tabernacle. We've looked at the Ark of the Covenant. We've looked at the table of showbread, the golden candlestick, also known as the menorah, the actual tent structure itself, and the bronze altar where the sacrifices were made. And then last week, we began to deal with a thing called the priesthood. And we looked at the various garments and equipment and gear, the ephod, the breastplate, 
uh, the stones, a robe, a tunic, a turban, and a sash. All these things were equipment and uniform, if you would, and served as that in that purpose for the priest who served in the temple or in the tabernacle at that time. And so what is a priest? Well, he's not primarily a minister uh, for the Lord, but he is primarily a minister to the Lord. There's a big difference in four and two. Uh, Two can be done through prayer and the word and praise to him, adoration, and, and just worship in his direction. And we talked about how the Bible teaches us now that all believers are priests. And there were lessons for carrying burdens and doing the things in love and serving God with holiness. Now we're going to look at more principles of what it means to serve the Lord as a priest. We see in chapter in chapter 29 is where we're at tonight, in verses 1 through 37, the ordaining of the priest, and verses 1 through 9, the dressing again of the priest. And we see Aaron and his sons being consecrated or sanctified or set apart for service as unto the Lord. And so verse 1 says, And this is what you shall do to them, to hallow them for ministering to me as priests. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And like Paul, I'm totally amazed at the goodness and the grace of God that he would include me in this glorious privilege called ministry. It is a privilege, guys, for us to minister you know, to the Lord. Ministry is a privilege because of the present blessing. With what measure you met out, it shall be measured unto you, Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, verse 24. That is that we give out, and what we give out, we'll get back. And I found that, I don't know about you, to be so true. When I pray for others, guess what? I end up getting blessed. When I share it with others, I end up getting blessed. You know, it's, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a situation where it might be in a crisis or a catastrophic event that's occurred or a critical incident that's happened in, in their family. And you're thinking that in your mind, you're going there as God's representative, that you're going to go there to, to care for and minister to, you know, folks that have really gone through it. And it ends up being that you're blessed more than they're blessed by your presence. And it almost happens every single time that the Lord will use situations like that in order to bless us. And as you give out, you get back. You don't do it to get back, but you do it as unto the Lord. And, uh, you know, you're confirmed with the truth that's in the Word of God. When you witness to others, your own faith grows deeper, it grows stronger, and it grows more powerful. And this shouldn't be surprising. After all, Jesus promised that we would receive power to become his witnesses there in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 8. They're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth and be a witness unto him. And the word that he uses for power is translated dunamis, from which we get our word dynamite. This dynamic experience The power, this power is like an electric charge. Therefore, like electricity, it will only enter that from which it can exit. The power, the electricity, that anointing of the Spirit is given to you, to me, that it might flow through you to others. Not get boxed up, not hang out, but it would go through, that you would be that conduit through which the Lord can work and through which the Lord can send His Holy Spirit to situations. And so again, going back to what we were talking about, you know, being able to go out as God's representative and talk to people that are hurting, talk to people that have been through things that have just been really traumatic for them. And uh, God gives you that opportunity to be that conduit through which he flows. Now the question is, what kind of clutter is in the conduit? You know, it's kind of like you need leaf, what is that thing? Leaf... uh, did you put on the gutters, leaf gutter, or whatever you call it? So old guys like us can't, don't need to climb ladders anymore, you know, you know the one I'm talking about. And so, you know, again, 
is our gutter clogged? You know, has it got leaves and mud and who knows what up inside of it? Or is it open? Does it is it ready to flow with the presence of God's Holy Spirit and by the the way of, of of ministry? And is that dynamic power of the Holy Spirit available and working? And so I, I enjoy that. I enjoy being that, that conduit through which the Lord flows. It, there's nothing like it, you guys. There's absolutely nothing like being able to be used as an instrument in God's hands to minister to folks. And a lot of people look at it and go, ministry, I, you know, I don't see myself as a minister. Just like the same thing. They, they don't see themselves as priests. But God sees you as a, a priest. First so Peter chapter 2, verse 9 or 4 or something like that. And so he sees you in, in that capacity. And that's a good thing, guys, like I said, to be used and to have the Lord flowing through you and using you as that conduit or that uh, that uh, vessel or instrument through which he can work. Just that dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. And I love it. But that's just only one reason. There's more reasons why I love being in ministry and being able to be used of the Lord in this way. Uh, secondly, uh, thing I, I think about, and this is obviously motivational-wise not the main reason, but I enjoy ministry because of the future rewards that come with it. What what we do in ministry, even as something as simple as giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, we're told in the Word that that will be rewarded by the Lord and will impact us eternally. Matthew chapter 10 for that. When we choose to do something, no matter how simple it is, in the name of the Lord and for His glory, in order that people will be drawn unto Him, impressed with Him, refreshed by Him. Guys, we'll have rewards in heaven at that Bema seat. And you might think, well, I don't care about rewards, but you will at that time. Trust me. When we get to heaven and the rewards are given, you're going to say, man, I wish I would have taken more seriously the admonitions to strive to run the race, to strive to win the prize, to gain the crown, according to Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. The third thing I love ministry for is because of real needs. Guys, think about it. Right now is, is a very exciting time to be a believer. Um, exciting because of the limitless opportunities that God has in store for you to be used of Him. People are lost. I don't know if you've noticed that, but they, they are wandering around like a sheep without a shepherd. And they don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. They are lost. They're depressed. They're discouraged. We're seeing new polls and new studies coming out all the time that the, the, the majority of people here in this situation or this age group or whatever it might be are depressed, discouraged. But worst of all, worse than all of that, is that they're without Jesus Christ and they're headed for hell. They don't know that God sent His Son not to condemn them. They don't know that. They think that God is mad at them. They think that God has sent His Son to condemn them. But He hasn't done that. He sent them to be saved and to save them. To die in place of them, not that they might be forgiven of their sins. That they might spend eternity in heaven. Just read John chapter 3, verse 17. And so I say, Lord, thank you as you should too. Thank you for letting me be in the ministry, in a sense, with you. You know, as he gives to us the ability, the open doors to walk through and to share his love. And then he does all the work, guys. He's the one that's doing the work. He just uses us and lets us come along. I'll never forget when I was a little kid, my dad was a carpenter, a finished carpenter. And he used to always let me go along with him on his job so I could be the gopher and get this and get that and help sometimes with sanding or help sometimes with planing or whatever it might be. But man, there was a whole bunch of skills he had as a finished carpenter. And what an exciting thing in the same way, similarly, when God lets us come along and lets us do the work and all the while knowing that he's the one that's actually doing it. And as he does that work, he gives to us the credit. He gives to us that opportunity just to minister to people. And so, so important. And, and so important that we say, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be in the ministry. Because I see 
people all around me, and you, I know you guys do too, that are confused. And the thing of it is, you've got such and been given such simple and significant answers to share with them. God has given you a, a, a treasure chest. He's given you a toolbox, if you would, of things that you can come out and share with people and encourage them and come alongside of them. And so he's given that opportunity for you. For although you might earn a living as a school teacher, as a carpenter, as an electrician, or, or whatever, understand this. Regardless of what you're doing as your occupation, as your career, as your job, you are in the ministry every much as much, every bit as much as I am. And the division between the clergy and the laity, that's a man-made distinction completely without biblical basis. Because Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That's the job that he's given to each one of us. To be ordained, to go forth, to go forth and share the gospel and spread the gospel. Now you might look at that and go, well, that's all fine and dandy, Joe, but I don't know if I'm properly prepared for ministry. We'll read on. He talks about hallow. That is to consecrate, to sanctify, to dedicate, to be holy. And really it speaks of the process of how a man became a priest. This is how to be that person that God uses, how to be that instrument that he procures and, and begins to do his work. And notice verse 1 and the second half of it. The first thing is you take one young bull and two rams without blemish. Verse 2, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. And then verse 3, you shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and with the two rams. Then verse 4, and Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Aaron and his sons were to be brought to the door. So were we in, in our own way. The Spirit of God directed somebody. Somebody out there came, and maybe it was somebody in your neighborhood, someone maybe even in your family or someone at work or wherever, school, or wherever you go, but God brought somebody by the Spirit of God, directed by the Spirit of God, and directed them to maybe bring you to a church service or invite you to a, a, a you know, a, a Billy Graham or Greg Laurie type uh, harvest festival, uh, an evangelistic meeting that you would learn about the grace of God, that you'd learn about the goodness of God. And so they witnessed to you, they talked to you, they were the ones that brought you to that door that leads to eternal life. We were brought to Jesus, John, according to John chapter 10, verse 7. And then first four, first four, the second part, it says, And you shall wash them with water. Aaron and his sons didn't wash themselves. They were washed, which speaks of baptism, guys. They were washed before what? They were washed before serving. Have you ever seen those signs in the restroom of a restaurant? It says to the employees, Make sure you wash your hands before going back to work. Don't you hope that they do that? That they listen to that? That they can read it, actually? I do. Something that a priest was to do before becoming ordained and putting to, you know, put to work was to wash. There is a type of washing that God desires for his priests to complete. And it's talked about in Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And so husbands ought to love their wives, their own wives, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, I don't know about you, but I think most women like the idea of something that removes wrinkles and spots, right? That pretty much goes without saying. 
How is it that he does this? Well, he does it, we're told, with his word. The washing of the water by the word, verse 26 of Ephesians 5. And he takes that word in the person's life. It'll happen to you a little bit tonight as we're going through verse by verse through the Bible. As you're taught in church, you're listening to God's word. You'll hear about God's heart for you, how much he loves you, how much he wants to work that work in you. You'll hear about that love. you hear about the great love that he has. You'll hear about the kinds of things that God wants to do in your life that will blow your mind. You know, the things that you maybe, maybe never considered, you never even really thought about because you didn't think you were qualified, but you're more than qualified through Christ Jesus. And hopefully it happens every day. Hopefully as you get up for devotions or in the night before you go to bed, you read the word and you allow the word to enter into your life, into your heart, into your very soul. Hopefully that work is taking place and going on. Hopefully you're learning the discipline of reading a little bit of your Bible every day and you're taking that in. This is... Also, one of the ways that a husband is to love his wife, through the words that he speaks to her. Guys, your words ought to be building up your wife, not tearing her down. Your words should be making her more beautiful every day. And then in verse 5, then you shall take the garments. I know you guys are looking at this going, you're going 46 verses tonight? Yes, I am. I'm going to try. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron. Hey, again, the consecration instructions. And so take the garments that have been made and then put the tunic on Aaron. You put it, the assistants, the other priest, whoever was doing the ceremony, you put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate and gird them or gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. And you shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. And verse 5 and 6 talk about putting on the various priestly garments that are from chapter 28. And after coming to the door of salvation, being plugged into the water of baptism, we see Aaron robed now in garments that he didn't make. It's explaining the process. It's explaining the procedure in order to get Aaron where he needs to be and to get... um, Aaron's sons and the rest of the the tribe, the Levitical tribe, where they need to be in order to serve the Lord. And so these garments that Aaron didn't make, he didn't buy them. He didn't even put them on. He just stood there and the robes were put on him in this ordination ceremony. Verse 7, and you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head and anoint him. And again, Aaron didn't notice anoint himself. He simply stood still and the anointing oil was poured upon his head. That word anointing is an important word. It means to smear, to anoint, to spread a liquid. This special anointing oil is to be in a mixture of olive oil and various spices according to Exodus chapter 30. We'll see that next week. But the word is used to describe three kinds of people. Kings were called anointing ones. The Messiah was called the anointed one and priests were called also anointed ones. And they were to pour this oil on. It wasn't just to be dabbed. It wasn't just to be rubbed on the priest's forehead, but it was to be poured over his head. Now in the Bible, oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the anointed one and the Messiah. And John writes in John three thirty four, for God's spirit is upon him without measure or limit. In other words, he didn't have just a dab of the Holy Spirit. The psalmist writes about the blessing of people getting along together and gives us a description of the anointing that takes place. In Psalm 133, verse 1 and 2, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Aaron didn't also just get a dab as the Lord in the same manner. 
It wasn't just a bit. It wasn't just a dab of the Holy Spirit. It was poured on him. And the blessing of unity has a taste of the power of the Holy Spirit. Powered by the Holy Spirit, guys. God's desire, listen, for ministry is not for it to be done in your own strength. For we know that he says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's not by my power, my, my ingenuity. It's not by my intellectual pursuits or, or, or accomplishments. It's not by any of those things. But here, God's desire, he says, for ministry is that it would be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not in the power of man, not, not in stuff that we can do, not in the talents that we've been given that God has blessed us with because those are things that are simply gifts from the Lord that we give back and we turn back to him and say, Lord, use these things for your glory. Use these things for your, uh, just to be blessed, Lord, in whatever way you can. But for us to realize that we're nothing without him and that his desire for any ministry that we would partake in, that we would be a part of, would be that it would be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. You remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he told the apostles to stay put in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere. I want you guys to wait. And so they were not supposed to go anywhere or do anything until a certain event took place. Something that they were to wait for to happen. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we learn what that is. For it tells us, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is what the apostles experienced on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. The Spirit came upon them that they might be used to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But you see, Jesus wanted his followers to wait until the right time. Wait until it was ready. Wait until things were ready to go. And so, wait. Don't do any ministry until they had received the power of, the, of God, really. And this is exactly what's being pictured here in the anointing of the priest. One of the most important things you can do as a priest is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because again, it can't be your own strength and power. We've got to have the power and the might, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit, that anointing, if you would, upon our lives. So one of the most important things in your function as a priest. And remember we said you're already in that category. The royal priesthood. That's what we belong in. But really one of the most important things that we can do as a priest. Is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you have a desire to be used by God. To help others. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No matter what it is that I do. Whether I'm doing ministry. Whether I'm just on my own. Just. You know, talking with people or chatting with people, you know, or doing something with chaplaincy. I don't want to do any of those things. Remember, we talked about it, going on the raft trips and just sitting there going, Lord, I don't want to do this unless you go with me. And, and it's not, you know, it's, it's my insufficiency. My sufficiency is Christ. But my inf insufficiency is when I try to start doing it on my own and doing my own thing. A.C. Dickinson said, when we rely on an organization, we get what an organization can do. When we rely on education, we get what education can do. When we rely on eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely on the Holy Spirit, we get what God can do. And we see what God can do. Guys, there's no better way of doing things. Welber Chapman a biblical uh, teaching preacher of the early 20th century was already in ministry when he was filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time in his life. And he said it happened after someone asked him, if you, Wilbur, if you're not willing to lay down everything to the Lord, 
Are you willing to be made willing? If you're not at the point now where you're willing to lay down everything for the Lord, is there a willingness for that to take place in your life? You know, you read through the very first chapter of Isaiah and you see in there his description of Israel in just the wretched condition that they're in and the need for repentance, their need for turning around and going back the other direction. And he talks to them concerning, uh, come let us reason together, though your sins be red as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And then he goes on a little bit around, I think, chapter uh, 1, verse 15. And, and he begins to say, if you're willing and obedient, then you shall taste of the good of the land. Guys, don't you want to be blessed? Don't you want to have just the blessings of the Lord upon your life? And I'm not saying that you haven't already, but I'm telling you, guys, with that willingness and with that obedience comes blessing. And it's not that we even do it for that purpose. We do that because we want to see the smiling face of our Lord when we get to heaven saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou in to the rest. There's nothing going to be better than that, guys. And so... Here, Wilbur Chapman, Bible teaching preacher, are, at this point was already in ministry when he was filled, so he didn't receive the Holy Spirit. He was doing it in and of his own strength. And so he, they asked him, he says, are you going to lay everything down for the Lord? Are you willing to be made willing? And he thought that seemed like it was an easy enough thing to do. So alone in prayer, Wilbur Chapman, he surrendered everything. I mean... Everything was given unto the Lord. And willing to give up his time, his pleasures, his ambitions, and his family. And when he got to the point where he had, as best he knew, laid every part of his life on the altar, he said, Lord, I give it up. It's all yours. And then without any great emotion, he humbly asked the Holy Spirit to fill him and to take charge of his life. And that simple step, that simple one-two punch, so to speak, was the major turning point of his life and of his ministry. Well, Jesus talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. When he said in John chapter 7, verse 37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And so guys, if you want the Holy Spirit to fill you, if that has not happened or taken place, Here's the one thing, you need to be thirsty. You need to be thirsting for that. You need to come to Jesus and ask him to fill you. And you simply need to receive it. You simply need to believe it. And God says he'll do it. He doesn't ask you to experience a special feeling. He doesn't ask you to speak in some foreign language. He, doesn't, he just simply asks you to believe. And so verse 8, he goes on, he says, Then, you shall bring his sons in this procedure and you'll put tunics on them, verse 9. And you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put the hats on them. The priest shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And so you shall consecrate Aaron and his son. And so verses 8 and 9 talks about putting tunics on Aaron's son as well. So just as Aaron was given a priestly garment, so were his sons and there's no effort that was put forth on their own. They didn't put their arms through the sleeves. They didn't do anything. They just simply because of their linkage to Aaron, the high priest. Because in the same way, we are the royal priesthood. And if you're wondering where that scripture is, it's one of them is 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. But we too, because we are that royal priesthood, we too are robed with the garments of salvation. We're robed with the robes of righteousness. Psalm 132, verses 9 and verse 16. And our part is simply to receive the righteousness that he wants to give to you and me as a free gift. Then in verses 10 through 14, we see him begin to talk about the sin offering. And it says in verse 10, You shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the bull. Putting their hands on the head of the bull was a way of identifying with the bull, as if the bull is taking their place, but also a way of saying that their sins are being put upon the bull. 
Then, verse 11, you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. The thing you're going to find out and the thing that you're going to see here, sacrifice is a horrible, horrible, gory, bloody mess. Our society repels by the thought of it. But the image is appropriate because sin is a horrible thing and sin has terrible consequences. Verse 13, and you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull with its skin and its ophal you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. And herein what you see is the first of three sacrifices as part of this ordination ceremony that we're seeing being carried out. For Matthew chapter 16 verse 24 says this, there can be no true ministry without sacrifice. Can't happen. The sacrifice of the bullock was for a sin offering. The hands of Aaron and his sons placed upon the bullocks signified that they acknowledged their sin and that they understood to deal with it required nothing less than the shedding of blood. This gory procedure is the sin offering where an animal gives up its life to pay for your sins. But the principle is here that you should not miss is that God uses forgiven people. Do you know that? I know people that live their whole walk in the Lord as they've given their lives to the Lord, not really understanding this. Looking at their life and feeling they're disqualified, that they can't do anything for the Lord because God can't use forgiven people. But guess what? God uses forgiven people all the time. One of God's greatest desires is for the world to know his forgiveness. God has spent the greatest price to obtain our forgiveness. What did he do? He sent his only son to die for us, to pay for our sins. And God wants the world to know that he's ready to forgive them. The people God wants to use are people who know forgiveness. Makes it much easier for them to explain it to somebody that has no idea what that concept means. People who are good at forgiveness. As in Matthew chapter 18, and starting in verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How many times, you know, this bozo does this stuff and, you know, I have to forgive him? How many times? Up to. And then Peter, you know, Peter thought he was doing good because he said up to seven times. And I'm sure in his mind he thought that, you know, the Lord would go, oh, Peter, wow, you mean you can forgive seven times? Man, you know, and Peter's going, ha, yeah, yeah. But that's not what the Lord was leading up to. For in verse 22, Jesus, in Matthew 18, verse 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you, up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. 490, wow. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, like millions of dollars. But as he was not able to pay, the master commanded that he be sold with his wife his children, and all that he had, and that payment would be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, thousands of dollars. And he laid the hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me. I will pay you all. And he would not. 
but went through him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And they came and they told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion upon your fellow servant, just as I had pity upon you? And his master was angry. And he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Guys, understand, God wants us to be forgiving. He wants us to let it go. You know, aside from the fact that bitterness, it'll break you. It'll absolutely break you. And so God's desire is for us to forgive. His desire is also that we learn forgiveness so well that we'll forgive others just like that. Our forgiving others is a reflection of how God has forgiven us. Maybe you've had a hard time forgiving somebody in your family, in your circle of influence, or someone that has done you wrong. And maybe you need to go back and find out about God's forgiveness all over again. Do you need God's forgiveness before you forgive others? The second offering was the burnt offering in verses 15 through 18. And so this sacrifice was made for the priest, this burnt offering. And the principle of a burnt offering, and we've shared this before already, but the principle of a burnt offering went beyond just payment for sins that you've committed. For it involved the total consecration of the person to God. It was consumed completely when you put that offering up there. And so it involved the total consecration of the person to God. With the sin offering, only some of the animals burnt on the altar. But with the burnt offering, the entire animal was burnt on the altar. The entire animal being given over to God. So it's a picture of the worshiper completely giving himself to God. Total dedication. Total, God, totally gone. Verse 15 you shall also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around the altar. You shall, shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and with its head. And you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord." So many lambs and animals, it, it just it's mind-boggling to see how many, many they went through through the course of even a day. Uh, but those that were brought before the Lord for these offerings for sin and the burnt offerings and the other offerings that we're going to see here in a moment. But again, speaking of the, really the entire devotion to God. The first offering dealt with sin. This one dealt with service. The third offering is the peace offering. And that's going to deal with sanctification. Consecration offering, verses 19 through 29. Now, any person we know could offer sin offerings and burnt offerings. And this next section that we're going to read through is about offering that which is unique to the priest. And so in verse 19, it says, You shall also... Take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram. One of the interesting parts of this offering is verse 20. And this is, you're going to think, this is weird. But notice what it says, because each of these speaks of a different part of the body and a different function of the body. Notice verse 20. He says in verse 20, Then you shall kill the ram, take some of its blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. I won't show you that. And sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. It wasn't just the whole man that was given to the Lord, but there were some specific parts singled out as well. 
One lady was recounting the story of her youth. One day, her mother was out and her dad was looking after this little toddler, two and a half years old. And was home because she just recovered from a bad cold. But someone had given her a little tea set as a get well gift and it was one of her favorite ended up being one of her favorite toys and so at this particular time her dad was in the living room engrossed in the evening news and she brought her daddy a little cup of tea which was just water but after several cups of tea and lots of praises for such a good job and a good cup of tea the mother finally came home And dad had her wait in the living room to watch the little girl bring the cup of tea to the dad. It was just the cutest thing you could could imagine. And so her mom waited. And sure enough, this little toddler came down the hall with a cup of tea for her daddy. And she came and gave it to him and watched him drink it. And then said, as the mother watching this said only as a mother would say, did it ever occur to you that the only place that she can reach to get water is from the toilet? Don't dwell on that too long. Sometimes we think we're doing the right things, all the right things. We think we're serving daddy just like we should, but it's really not all that great when you think about it. Perhaps some of the places we get our ideas aren't the best. And so consecration gets really specific here. And notice verse 21. It says, And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed and his sons and his sons' garments with him. So Aaron, as as Aaron and his sons stood In this ordination ceremony, blood was put on their right ears, their right thumb, their right big toes. Why? Again, people often feel as though they've heard things they shouldn't have listened to. They've done things they shouldn't have been involved in. And they've walked places that they ought not to have gone. So ear, thumb, big toe. And therefore, the blood was applied to the ear, to the thumb, and to the toe to signify that our shortcomings in what we've we've heard, in our shortcomings, in what we've done, when we've walked, you know, all those are covered by the blood, cleansed and forgiven because of the blood. Aaron and his sons were allowed to be in ministry solely because they were a chosen family. Not one of the sons was left out. And the same is true for us. For we are in the family of the great high priest, Jesus Christ. That's the qualification for you. Nothing was done by Aaron and his sons in this ordination ceremony. They were passive through the entire ceremony. And everything instead was done for them. They were amazed, amazingly passive, guys. We tend to think, well, I better do this, or I've got to do that, or I've got to, I've got to shore this up. But this illustration shows us very clearly that it's not, listen, it's not what we do that matters, but what Jesus has done. We're always got to, got to, got to. But it's rather get to, get to, get to. And it's nothing that you have to do because God has already done it through his son. And when he hung on the cross, he spread his arms up and he said what? It is finished. It's done. It's done. And so the Lord has done that for us. Verse 22. Also you shall take the fat of the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys and the fat of them are that is on them, the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, one loaf of bread, one cake made with oil, one wafer from the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire to the Lord. 
Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be your portion. And from the ram of the consecration, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering, which is waved, and the thigh of the heave offering, which is raised, of that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and for his sons by a statute forever. For it is a heave offering. It shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel, from the sacrifices of their priests, uh, from the sacrifices of their peace offerings. That is their heave offering to the Lord. And so the hands of Aaron and his sons, once they were empty, you remember when they were able to put them on the head? Um, but, and that's a, the sin offering actually. But now their hands are filled and they're doing the heave offering and the wave offering. On one mountain ridge stood the people of Israel. On the other were the Philistines. And in the valley between them, Goliath taunted the people of Israel day by day, challenging them to send someone to do battle with him. The Israelites were understandably terrified. They didn't want to have anything to do with Goliath because Goliath was at least nine feet, nine inches, and possibly as tall as 11 feet, six inches. So heavy was his spear that the tip alone weighed 30 pounds. And to put that into perspective, shot putters throw balls, a little ball weighing, a little steel ball weighing a mere 16 pounds. The armor that he wore to protect his chest was itself 200 pounds. Goliath was indeed massive. And when the young shepherd boy from Bethlehem arrived on the scene, hearing the jeers and the the mocking, if you would, from Goliath, he said, give me a chance. Let me take him on. You see, while everyone else thought Goliath was too big to hit, David thought he was too big to miss. And turning down the offer of armor too big for him, David went into the valley of Elah. It was the only thing that he was accustomed to using. That was his sling. But it was an empty sling, guys. And this is an important point that you need to remember. When he went down into that valley to survey, guys, his sling, he had a sling, but it was empty. There in the very valley in which he would do battle, he found five stones, one of which would say, slay Goliath and take him down. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. Just as it wasn't David, or until David had already committed, and this is the thing that I think is important. David committed himself to the battle, and it wasn't until he committed himself to the battle that he found the stones. Just as it wasn't until Aaron and his sons were to make an offering to the Lord that they were given bread and meat, It won't be until you start sharing your faith and reaching out to people that you will be given exactly what you need for ministry. Matthew chapter 10 verse 19 says, preparing to minister is not nearly as necessary as daring to minister. For it's when we are in the valley of confrontation that we'll look down and you know what? We'll see our five smooth stones waiting for us, waiting to be put to God's use in our hands. Verses 29 through 37 talk about how the priestly garments were handed down from one generation to the next. And then there's a description of how the priests are to eat part of the consecration ram for dinner. The whole process of consecration, it would take about a week. So notice verse 29. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. That son who becomes priest in his place shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. And so just as Aaron's garments would be passed on to his sons, your character, dads, will be passed on to your kids as well. If I want Caleb to be a man of prayer, I've got to be a man who prays. If I want Josh to be a man who loves the word, I've got to be one that's given to study in the scripture. And if I want Seth to be honest, I must cultivate honesty and integrity because the garments I wear, for better or worse, are going to be passed on to my kids. Oh, no doubt about it. 
Our kids are going to make their own choices. There's no doubt about that. But the most important thing that we can do to help our kids choose to be godly is to cultivate our own private, personal walk with the Lord. To love God, to walk with Him. And if we do that, it will be passed on from generation to generation. Not only is this a precept, but it's a promise. For when we see our greater one than Aaron, our great high priest, our Savior, we shall be like him. First John 3, 2. I cannot be satisfied until I awake in thy likeness. David declared in Psalm seventeen fifteen, what a great and happy day that'll be. Verse 31, we're making progress, guys. Hang in there. And you shall take the ram of consecration and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat those things with which the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the consecration offerings uh, or of the bread remains until the morning, then you should burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. And thus you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Seven days you shall consecrate them and you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. And they're just piling up. And you shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it. And you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it. And the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. So for seven days, Aaron and his sons were to seek the Lord. They were to offer sacrifices and they were to consecrate or dedicate the altar because it wasn't only the priest who needed to be consecrated, but it was the process. So the actual priest, yes, but also the process needed to be sanctified, to be set apart and to be consecrated. So not only the minister, but the manner. And it's the wise person who prays, Lord, I know I need to be consecrated. I need to be cleansed, anointed, empowered. And not only me or me only, but also the things I do. So not just me, the things that I do. May the process, may the work, may the be all, each and every one of them altered by you, even as the altar was consecrated to you. So how does that happen? How does that take place? Daily offerings, verses 38 through 46. Moses now gets some instruction that goes beyond the consecration of the priest. God gives instruction about the kinds of offerings the priests were to do each and every day. A burnt offering twice a day. Total concentration twice a day. Notice verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year. Day by day continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other in the twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah uh, of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hen of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hen of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight and you shall offer it or with it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be continually our continual burnt offering throughout your generations. At the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord will I will meet with you to speak with you. And so burnt offerings every morning, every evening. And it's interesting that this is what connected with the concept of God speaking to the people. Those things were interlinked, if you would where they would get their guidance from the Lord. The lesson here, direction from daily commitment, being daily in our walk. You know, are you looking for God to speak to you? Do you want to know what his will is for your life? A, a will, a life, guys, of constantly hearing from God, consistently being directed by God, comes from a life that has learned to offer up the morning and evening sacrifice. What's that about? I, th I think it's best described in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies 
a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect gift or will of God. Here's the way that it works. When you give yourself completely to God and you allow him to do his work inside of you, you're going to find that he changes the way that you think. He changes the things that you want. And he begins to actually lead your life. That's what we talked about. I think it was Sunday morning, Psalms 37, 4, where it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And you see, with those new desires, you find that you get to live your life doing things that you want to do, not the things that you have to do. I want to be the same way that Wilson Bentley was. I want to die the same way I think that he did. Wilson grew up on a farm in Jericho, Vermont. And as a young boy, he developed a fascination with snowflakes. Obsession might have been maybe perhaps a better word for it. Most people go indoors during snowstorms, but not Wilson. He would run outside when the flakes began to fall, catching them on a black velvet, looking at them under a microscope, and then taking pictures of them before they melted. His first photo micrograph of a snowflake was taken on January 15th, 1885. Under the microscope, he said, I found the snowflakes were miracles of beauty and it seemed a shame that this beauty should not be seen and appreciated by others. Every crystal was a masterpiece of design and no one design was ever repeated. When a snowflake melted, that design was forever lost. Just that much beauty was gone without leaving any record behind. The first known photographer of snowflakes, Wilson pursued his passion for more than 50 years. He amassed a collection of 5,381 photographs that was published in his magnum opus titled Snow Crystals. And then he died a fitting death, a death that symbolized and epitomized his life. Wilson Snowflake Bentley contracted pneumonia while walking six miles through a severe storm and died on December 23rd, 1931. And that's how I figured out how I want to die. No, I don't want to die from a pneumonia. Don't get me wrong. But I think what I'd like to do is die doing what I love doing. Can't argue with that. Unless I get taken out with the rapture, that's fine too. But if I got to go the other way, I want to be doing what I love to do. I'm determined to pursue God-ordained passions until the day I die. Because life is too precious to settle for anything less. Verse 43, we're almost there. And there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. A lamb was to be sacrificed every morning and every evening and there seems to be a wonderful principle for which the Lord is laying the groundwork for even here in this. And that is that we are to start our day with a sacrifice of prayer and praise and we're to end it in the same way. Prayer in the morning opens the door to blessing. Prayer at night locks it in and makes us safe and secure. Why? Because the enemy doesn't snooze. He doesn't rest. He doesn't stop attacking. Therefore, if you wake up feeling blue and wondering why, it could be very well that you've been a target of him. But you can shield yourself to a large degree from his attacks by turning off the TV and praying before the end of your day. You might be thinking, man, I talk all day long. Why do I need to have a specific time of prayer in the morning and evening? Think of it this way. If I came home from a week at camp and said, Dottie, we don't need to t sit down and talk. We can just, you can follow me around and we'll talk on the go. How's that? Well, what kind of relationship would we have? There needs to be a constant flow of conversation through but for a marriage to be strong, there's got to be not only a quantity of time, but a quality of time where both people are focused on each other. As I suggest, that same thing is true in our relationship with the Lord. While we are to indeed pray without ceasing all through the day, there's also got to be times when we say, Lord, I'm here to talk to you. 
I'm here to hear from you. Quiet place, quiet time, quiet heart. To offer to the Lord the sacrifice of thoughtful, articulate, emotional, intellectual praise. We are there to press into the very presence of God, to pour out our heart, to focus exclusively on Him. And it's not a got to, it is a get to. Verse 44 so I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priest. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. While it was Moses who would consecrate Aaron and his sons, the garments and the altar it was God alone who could sanctify them for service. All that Moses could do was to portray through a biblical typology that which God and only God could do in reality. And it remains the same today. For the point at which communion or baptism, the Bible study or worship becomes the end and to themselves rather than that which points people to Jesus Christ that becomes the point at which the Lord's presence will tragically be missing from our lives. God declared, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. To all prayed that I might know him. And may his prayers be our prayers. Amen. Father, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Father, it's oftentimes when we come across a chunk of, of scripture that, Lord, we look at it and we go, what, what, what are you doing? What are, you, what are you talking about, Lord? And yet, even as we've seen tonight, there's so much more that it speaks of besides what is on the surface. And I just pray right now, Lord, for each person that's here and hung in there and just listened and, and Lord, received from you instruction that, Lord, you would bless them. That, Father, you would bless them with your word. And, Father, the things that we talked about, the nuances, and, Lord, just a little... A little not secrets, but the little hidden things that, Lord, you have included in your word, that we might just take those principles and apply them to our life. That, Lord, we might see the fruit of our willingness and our obedience and, Lord, just uh, getting rid of any stubbornness or, or anything that would hinder, anything that would keep us from being your vessel, Lord, in your hand, your instrument, Father. Let us be your gutter, Lord, that you transform and transport, Lord, your blessing, your message, your gospel, your good news to people that are dying, that so desperately need you, especially now, as we look around and we come to face to face to people all the time, all day long, that are in desperate need. Lord, help us not to miss that, but to be your instrument in your hand to do your work. And Lord, we'll give you the glory and the honor. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And as we go home tonight, let us start a new pattern, a new habit of, Lord, just approaching you and giving you the all glory and the honor for our life. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless the saints, Lord, as they go home. Give them a good night's sleep, Lord. And Father, I just lift these things before you and praise you and honor you and thank you in all these things and ask it now in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Good job, you guys.